Good evening, spiritual warriors. Welcome to Spiritual Warriorship, where we discuss books by His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami. I hope you've been here a while, and if you're not, or coming in new, welcome. We are now discussing from Spiritual Warrior 3, and as I've said, he has six spiritual warrior books and if you don't have and are interested you can get them from krishna.com or harinam press the publishers now have a website also it's um hari h a r i nama n a m a one word press one word hari nama press at um dot org just dot org and they have it set up really nice because you can see the front cover, you can see the content, you can even read an excerpt from the book and of course place orders if you like. So if you don't have already, I'm encouraging you begin collecting these spiritual warrior books. They're really, really wonderful. And there's also reflections on sacred teachings. Um, I'm reading from one of those now on um, the teleconference program and it's really wonderful Madhurya Kandambini so here we are spiritual warrior um, we're in chapter 6 of spiritual warrior 3 and we've been reading from a chapter entitled a uh, uh, spiritual warriors view of the world but again I don't know how many of you out there were here last week when I presented some questions from what we had read. And I'm really trying to make this an interactive um, process, even though you're out there and I'm here sitting. But I would like to get a sense of what you're getting from what you're hearing. Um, thankfully, I'm reading and I'm getting something I'm trying to grow and expand more every time I read. So I want to review the questions and check for answers if any of you have. Um, and maybe I'm also going to request tonight, I know there are silent listeners out there. We do get a count and maybe take a chance and sign into the chat room this evening and um, maybe let us know your name and where you're located or if you got the questions last week and I ask it you could write put your answer down okay can you understand what I'm trying to do um, I'm curious what's going on out there <laughs> and if you don't respond through the chat room and I also as I said I became courageous and I gave you an email address you could write to me and one of you did thank you very much I'm Mother Indrani 108 at gmail.com so if you're a little shy there and yet you did answer the questions and you want a little more detail or you want to share something do send me an email. So let's look at first review, spiritual warriorship. What have we been told or what did we speak of as far as a spiritual warrior? His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami tells us that a true spiritual warrior strives to master what? Weapons, right? Remember? Wish I could see you raise your hand. You remember what the weapons are. The weapons of love, humility, compassion, faith, and self-knowledge. And then, where do we deal with these weapons? How do we master them? We deal on the battlefield of consciousness. That's why we say spiritual warriors are unconventional and their weapons are unconventional. 
Okay, our battlefield is the realm of human consciousness. And what do we do there? We wage war against ignorance and lust and greed and those things that now plague our society. And what is our objective? Now we've got these weapons, we've got the battleground. What is our objective? Our objective it's a civilization where people live in harmony with each other and with God. Spiritual warriors. So it has to be a connection there with God. And what happens is that you become awakened and in tune with the effulgent spiritual environment. He's constantly reminding us of where our true home is and it's available but to do that and reach that what do we have to do we endeavor to develop ourselves we must work on ourselves um, I think there's a saying um, first to thyself be true then you can't be false to anything you must first develop, because you can't help others unless you've helped yourself reach that level that we're talking about. So endeavor to develop ourselves and share our understanding, because as we develop ourselves, we gain deeper understanding of who we are, who God is, and what our relationship with Him is. And then we can share that understanding with the people we meet and then give them tools. Now, if you've been following through, we've been on over a year now, if you've been following through, Bhakti Tirta Swami gives you many tools, if you will, technologies to reach that standard of understanding. And then you can help others discover and experience the truth of themselves. So that's what we're endeavoring to do by offering these, these readings every week. And as I said, hopefully um, some of you are getting a taste for it or finding something you can practically put in your life. And I'm trying to follow the scriptures where it says you do your work and you do your best and don't worry about the results. And I'm trying at that, I, I got myself to that. But now, again, since asking questions, and I know you're out there, again, I'm just saying, think on it, and we'll ask the questions again and try to find the answers together, okay? But with all of that, Bhakti Tirta Swami also reminds us that the spiritual path <laughs> of a spiritual warrior is not an easy path because again you're changing your consciousness you and you're using these weapons of love which you have to develop within yourself and discover what true humility really means because that's very powerful so it's not an easy path but it's a productive path and why isn't it an easy path because it demands discipline Mm -hmm. intense compassion and determination and unconditional love and it requires an understanding that this world is not the final chapter and we've been there before we keep talking about how to get back home which means this world is not our home and most Christ, Christ scriptures remind us of that. So we're on a mission here, spiritual warriors. And I hope you're ready to join the ranks or have already joined the ranks and are working towards bringing about this change. So now we'll go back to chapter 6. And questions we asked last week. How many in the chat room? That my technician. I can't read it and talk to you at the same time. Three other people besides me. Okay. There's three, four on the chat room. And are they familiar names? Um, 
there's Anuj. I don't know. Okay. He's from okay, let me try London. this with whoever's out there. And I'm encouraging those who may be out there and haven't ventured in um, to maybe take that step tonight courageously. But do you remember we asked the question to name two categories of people that are happy in the material world? Anybody out there want to answer that or put that answer? I'm learning patience also with this. Okay, I'll give you the answer. For the next set of questions, I'm going to want you to answer. But we were told in the very beginning that there are only two categories of happy people in the material world. Fools and transcendentalists. Remember? Now, fools are so oblivious <laughs> of what's going on in the misery that they manage to convince themselves that they're happy in this material prison. Huh? You're almost bound hand and feet, and yet you say, Oh, buddy, that's fun. But he says they're oblivious of that. Now the transcendentalists or spiritualists are happy because they can see above the material dualities and know that their parole is at hand. Because if you're following scriptures and, and sadhus and teachers, you're working towards being free. So they know and they can be. So everyone else is essentially miserable. And why? This is because calamity in the material world cannot be avoided. Just as water cannot be avoided in the ocean. If you're in this material world, and we are, those of us in these physical bodies, it's miserable. And it's supposed to be so that we will endeavor and work hard to get out of it because as we said before, we've been told it's really not our home. Okay, what was the next question? What were the skills we as spiritual warriors must develop? He told us. Okay, I'll tell you, <laughs> remind you, okay, because it's not hard. If you don't have the book, I know it's difficult hearing me read and I try to, you know, slow it down a bit so you can keep up. But if you have a book, it's easy, you can go back and check. So the material world is impermanent and constantly changing. One of the first skills we as spiritual warriors must develop is equipoise, balance in mind and body. And we must be equipoise in face of the constant change and chaos that's going on in this world. And he tells us, this is interesting, we must not become overly proud in a moment of happiness or overly fearful in a moment of distress. Why? Because happiness and distress will come to us of their own accord for as long as we reside in this realm. So he's given us quite a bit in the opening. Now, the next thing he wanted, he reminded us of, if we have spiritualists studying or sometimes we get so busy we forget some of our spiritual uh, studies. And he reminds us that a fundamental premise of spiritual teachings around the world is that we're not the spirit physical body. Hmm? You're not the body. You've been studying 
this ancient Vedic teaching you're hearing, but most religions. In fact, in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that both celestial and terrestrial aspects are within us. Now this scripture reminds us that while we are in the terrestrial or physical state, we are away from the Father in this physical state. But being accustomed, being accustomed to material existence, we can easily perceive the physical aspects of our being while our celestial parts are less easy to perceive. Hmm? You're not the body, you're something more. We've studied this. So how, but despite the perceptual difficulty, what must we constantly remember? And that's with the next question, if you're not the physical body, what are we? And what is this body? Anybody want to answer that? Any answers coming? <laughs> no? No answers? Not Bhu yet? Bhuvan Mohan is just like repeating what you're saying. Oh, he just okay. said, oh, he said spirit souls. Okay. That's a good answer, spirit souls. I like the way he put it, phrased it here. I've been quoting this to devotees and non-devotees, anybody. What did he say? He says, we are fundamentally spiritual, transcendental, and anti-material entities who are simply using these physical bodies as a vehicle. Hmm? fundamentally spiritual, transcendental, anti-material, using a physical body as a vehicle. It's a good way. This is what, from the time we started reading his books, he's been giving us this perspective of who we really are in so many different ways. And this is what's coming through in this particular chapter. So it's, it's good to think about that or ask yourself, if I'm not this physical body, then who am I? What am I? And what is this body? Okay? So that one's going to come again on the next test. Everybody finish exams if you're in school, I guess. I hope you passed everything. So we are fundamentally spiritual transcendental anti-material entity who are simply using these physical bodies as vehicles. Each body is like a garment, a ventriloquist dummy, without the spiritual spark within our flesh is absolutely lifeless. Okay? So, we can go on. I want to get to tonight's subject matter. But let's just look at the next question we had. And he brings us to realize that not only do we exist separately from our bodies, but also we cannot rely upon our physical senses for accurate knowledge. Why? because our senses are unreliable. For example, our eyes are lying to us at every single moment. Because sometimes, we, we, when he gives the example of looking in a cup, and our eyes may tell us that it's empty, but however, careful scrutiny, if you had took a swab and took, wiped that cup bottom and put it on a slide in a microscope, You'd see a lot of little things moving around. The eyes can't see that without that help. And our ears are dull, too. 
even though we may hear somebody talking to us sitting right next to us but sometimes we can't hear what's going on in the next room because right now I can hear I hope you don't hear the voices outside my window because I have it open for a little air but our ears are so dull that we cannot hear what is going on two rooms away and we're really deaf to that high, high sound that um, dogs may hear. And when we put on clothing, very often our senses are so dull they cannot even be aware of the feel of the fabric on our skin. And our sense of taste often leads us to eat too much and desire foods that are not healthy for the body. So overall, our senses are extremely dull and mislead us constantly. So it is crucial, crucial for us as spiritual warriors to understand that we have a non-physical essence that is eternal, has a mission, and is looking for ways to love and serve. Okay? So that's kind of a review. And what I'm going to do tonight, let's get to where we're to start tonight. And I do hope if you don't have the book, try to get a copy. This is a fantastic book. This is the one that has the 12 qualities of a spiritual warrior in it. So tonight we're going to look at reincarnation, fact or fiction. And we're also going to look at our karmic patterns. Now, many, if not most, of the spiritual traditions of the world accept reincarnation as a fact. Ancient African cultures, American Indians culture, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and mystic Christianity all recognize the validity of reincarnation. It's only the modern world that has been slow to acknowledge this idea. There is overwhelming evidence of reincarnation in both modern and ancient times. For example, methods such as hypnosis, regression, hypnotic regression, evoke apparent memories of past lives. People under hypnosis may speak languages they have never heard before, or recite detailed, ver ver verifiable memories of periods long before the reality of reincarnation that confirms the reality. I don't know if you remember recently I had taken it out and had with my notes for one of the classes of a little young boy who had these memories of a ship sinking and a battle and he kept going and finally they did a lot of regression and they followed he had these vivid pictures and they took him and it turned out with the scientists and doctors that he was a reincarnation of a soldier who had died during World War II in the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they could not ignore the things that he spoke of and the places that he, he spoke of and they went to these places. So that's modern this was just last year sometime that story came out and I'm sure many of you may have talked with people or read articles about it so it's not a whimsical thing now the Vedic tradition confirms the reality of reincarnation for example in Bhagavad Gita 2.13 it explains the transmigration of the soul. What does it say there? It says, in quotes, as the embodied soul continuously 
passes in this body from childhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. And that chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita, when I am discussing with friends and devotees or whomever about the soul, or, and I had this experience when uh, my daughter is with my daughter, she was leaving her body, and thankfully for this knowledge that I have found and been brought to, and my understanding, I was able to explain to her friends, most of them, the difference between the soul and the body and that her body was wrecked with cancer and but her soul was eternal and, and it really helped calm some some down um, to a better understanding. So it's so wonderful when you understand and that's when I refer people who are reading Bhagavad Gita to go to chapter two where Krishna breaks it down for Arjun who was getting upset about going out on that battlefield and killing his relatives, so to speak. Now, if we go to verse 816 in Bhagavad Gita, it explains, from the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all are places of misery, wherein repeated birth and death takes place. What does that mean? That means that not only do we have to die once, but we must perish over and over again as long as we are in this material dimension. Falling victim to such misfortune as accidents, disease, manslaughter, or some other grievous ill. He tells us that the Quran, 228 states, how do you deny Allah and you were dead and he gave you life? Again, he will cause you to die and again bring you to life. Then you shall be brought back to him. Now, modern reductionist thinking, however, combined with the economic incentive to keep us bound to material desires, propounds that we are no more than a collection of physical organs and chemical reactions. This outlook tends to support the you only live once attitude with no incentive to act responsibly this lifetime, right? Gives you a way out, oh, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, yeah, enjoy myself, you only live once. When I remember a friend of mine way back used to say, when you're gone, you're gone. Well, I knew there had to be something more at that time. So in contrast, mature individuals are ready to be responsible and accountable. Only immature people are not interested in accountability. Oh, we used to have lectures and classes all the time on accountability. Much of the fast pace and impersonal culture currently being embraced influences people around the world to become less and less accountable and simply function impulsively based on satisfaction of the senses. This of course makes them very easy to manipulate, exploit, and control. He tells us, even in the West, the idea of reincarnation was originally 
part of the Christian outlook. For example, early church fathers, such as Justin Martyr, um, 100 to 165 A.D., St. Clement of Alexandria, 150 to 220 A.D., and Origen, 185 to 254 A.D. What did they teach? They taught aspects of reincarnation. The belief in reincarnation remained in certain currents of Christianity until the 6th century when the emperor Justinian seeking to unify his empire outlawed the belief. Members of the priestly class also began to realize that the church could gain power and exploit the masses more easily if the general public did not have access to higher spiritual knowledge and believe that they only live once. So those of us today who have this knowledge, this understanding, we're very fortunate and we mustn't waste it. Are there any comments or questions from anyone? Um, Bhuvan Mohan posted um, a YouTube link about reincarnation. Of oh, that young boy? I don't no. know oh. what it's about. but And then I posted a link um, about a book on reincarnation. Okay. From Krishna.com. Good, good. Okay, so you're getting further information. Okay? How many are in the chat room? Mm -hmm. Four. Four, so. okay. Okay, let's look at karmic patterns because reincarnation, karma, we need to have an understanding of this so that we can be more accountable and responsible and have a better understanding of things that are happening in our life and in the world as we look around. He tells us spiritual warriors must examine this idea of reincarnation as deeply as possible. So read more, do research, get an understanding of what it, what it really means. Study it. Why, why does he tell us this? Because our present situation is inextricable linked to our previous lifetimes. Mm. You see, we have to have that understanding. We've been here before. We've been here a lot of befores. If we understand in our teaching, if we hadn't been or, or we wouldn't be here in these physical bodies looking at each other, talking and laughing. We would be back home. But we're here now, and it's not the first time we're here. Millions of lifetimes. And prayfully, I'm praying prayfully this lifetime I get it right so that I can keep going on. But given that we are eternal and that our real identity exists on a continuum, our future lives will be shaped by the sum total of everything we are presently doing and thinking. Hmm? The present moment is the only moment really there is of what we are thinking and doing and yet it's going to influence our next life. Ultimately, it is our interactions with the cosmic laws of God that are especially relevant to the next life we are preparing. Our thoughts and actions now shape what we will become. 
Hmm? Our current life combined with the residue from previous lives will determine our future karma. So again, when he said it's important that spiritual warriors examine the ideas of reincarnation as deeply as possible, which means as you do that, you'll understand that you've been around and around and around and around. And your coming around and coming around is caused by your thoughts and actions and deeds in each particular lifetime. But again, as I say, those who are here now who are getting the knowledge and the wisdom and you have the Bhagavad Gita and you have Srila Prabhupada coming, Lord Shaitan, and we're getting a clearer understanding of what it means and how to prepare ourselves to stop that cycle of going around and around and around, which means we have to be more mindful of what we just said, our thoughts and actions now, because they shape what we will become. So our current life, right here, right now, combined with the residue from previous lives, accepting you've been around and around and around and around previous lives, will determine our future. Karma. What is karma? Remember we used to say, we know we were talking, what goes around comes around. Well, you were threatening somebody who did something you didn't like, right? But you would, it was true. What goes around comes around. He defines karma is the principle that every action produces a reaction and somehow affects every living entity in God's creation. I remember discussing with some friends at one time that if people in general understood this law of karma, they might be kinder to each other, they might speak differently to each other, they may be more mindful, and what a world that would be with realizing that their thoughts and words and actions are affecting them. People, you know, I think we had studied with this, it's not about pointing fingers and blaming. You did, you did, it's your fault, it's your fault. We're the ones who have to take life again. What is our action? What is our thoughts? What are our deeds? You see? Because that other, they have that to go through the same thing. So we just said, what is karma? Karma is the principle that every action produces a reaction and somehow affects every living entity in God's creation. Now, the effects we cause will eventually be reflected back to us. Hmm. Did you hear that? The effects we cause will eventually be reflected back to us. How many of you out there think of some word or action within the past week that you might not want coming back at you? <laughs> Think about it. That's where knowledge comes in and using the knowledge so that you're mindful of what's going on in your life at the moment. The way others view and behave toward us is directly affected by how we view and behave toward God and our fellow beings. Can you repeat that? Hmm? Can you repeat that, please? Repeat that, sure. The effects that we cause will eventually be reflected back to us. The way others view and behave 
towards us is directly affected by how we view and behave towards God and our fellow beings. Uh, I remember in one of the other books I was reading and um, Bhakti Tirta Swami is talking about karma. He talks about it quite a bit in all of his books. He keeps, he repeats and gives different examples to help us. But he was telling the story of um, Shri Prabhupada somewhere walking or in India somewhere and an Indian gentleman was wearing him out, criticizing, finding fault and just carrying on so badly. And Shri Prabhupada said, I must have done something to him in his past life. And uh, uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami gave that example of Shri Prabhupada's humility plus an example to the rest of us that if something is going on with some somebody or something, if you have knowledge, it ain't about what is wrong with them. It's like, what did I do to them my last life? It's interesting. In fact, I just had a flashback to well, many years ago, but I had got this book on reincarnation. I wish I could remember it, but it was one of the New Age books. But after reading that and getting some understanding of reincarnation and past life, I looked at my children differently. I remember it was like, I wonder what we were in another lifetime and how. But I became more mindful of how I spoke to them or what our interaction was. It was an interesting shift in consciousness by getting a better understanding. So what we're saying, not only... Yes. There's a question. There is? Mm -hmm. Who? Bhuvan Mohan. What? <laughs> Would you ask... Oh, sorry. If we might ever find ourselves in a position where we wanted to come back so as to be able to help others. I think I hear well you, you once you purify yourself and you can go back, you go back, you can ask to come back to help others. It's about becoming purified enough that you're qualified to come back to help others. If you're not purified enough, you're going to come back anyway to become more purified. So yes, um, I, I've read that and understand that that's possible. Um, I, in fact, somewhere there was talk, I don't remember if it was a class or what, that we shouldn't, I don't know, what was it? Something about going, just focusing and going back to Godhead. It was, it was focusing on wanting to help others after. But yeah, if I got your question, that, that what you're asking, is that what it was about? Can you come back? Okay. So it says, not only must we sometimes experience various miseries based on our accumulated karma. Don't forget, lifetime after lifetime, and one lifetime, you may not pay all your dues, and you're gone. You gotta do go through it more. So there may be various miseries, and this is based on accumulated karma. But we must also realize that the accompanying a degree of pain, fear, or suffering we experience is a measure of the extent of our karma. Does that say you can bear it better? It does say, if again, if you have this knowledge and you know now, or understanding now who you are as an eternal being, as a part and parcel of the Supreme, and you're his servant and you have a relationship and he has told you he will take care of you and protect you. Yes, you can go through and he will help you through. I just had a paper here, I put it where the Lord was telling a devotee, he puts him through trials and tribulation, but he gives him the strength, he gives us the strength to move through. Now, with many of us acting whimsically, 
without regard for karmic pollution, we may be producing the resulting environment that can become extremely complex. We may even begin to believe that events are happening by accident without rhyme or reason. But I think most mature people now I've heard there are no accidents. However, this is not the case, she says. Many of the calamities happening on the planet today are directly related to humanity's collective karma for the levels of disturbance that have been generated in the past. I believe it was Carl Jung, the psychologist, I remember, had a, a, a theme or a theory on collective consciousness of that's what happened. Um, I remember also reading in some of the books that what was it? Um, oh, my mind fails me, but how some civilization the entities come back together in the new civilization, a new time, and they have to still work out their karma. So as we develop a greater understanding, this is important, as we develop a greater understanding of karma, how it acts upon us, we begin to realize that there are no accidents. Everything has a purpose. When the twists and turns of fate become less mysterious and less frightening, we begin to accept responsibility for the future we are creating and endure our present difficulties as necessary purification. I want to repeat that. <laughs> when the twists and turns of fate become less mysterious and less frightening, we begin to accept responsibility this is he's mentioned this at least three times in this section for the re, we accept responsibility for the future we are creating hmm? and endure our present difficulties as necessary purification this is a crucial step in our maturation process. I just remembered when I spent that year in um, Uganda, East Africa, it was a spiritual community. And everything that happened, all they did, it's for purification, it's karma, and they, it was amazing. Um, uh, what was it, I think I, I got sick, some part, I forgot how I got sick. And all he would tell me, I was being purified. Yeah, fine, but get me to a doctor, you know. Like, <laughs> I was ready for spiritual advancement, but I needed help. But that was, they were very, very keen on watching different things and had a strong understanding of reincarnation and karma. He says that some examples are more obvious than others. The super rich members of the leisure class who boarded the Titanic were out to prove their mastery over the ocean. One of God's most unconquerable elements. At the height of their arrogance, the ship sank, drowning many of the passengers after reducing many of them to a state of utter dread, desperation, and helplessness. Now, he now tells us not, see, this is why I like 
Swami Krishnapad. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Bhakti Tirtha Swami. He puts it in your face what it is. What's causing it. And then he says, like now, not all karma is negative. Oh, tell me about that. He says, we also carry with us the positive reactions for those activities we have performed in the mode of goodness. We can even carry certain useful abilities and understandings with us from lifetime to lifetime. Here's the example. Instinct is a modern term, term for knowledge or ability that seems innate with apparently no previously learned pattern. What we call instinct, however, may be in direct correlation with learning in previous lives. So, that's encouraging, isn't it? Doesn't all have to be bad. We also, in past lives, were pious at points or did some good, <laughs> mode of goodness things, caring, charity, caring for others, loving. But we got probably a little mixed there why we had to come back. But we bring that with us. And even now we hear, if we leave our bodies, we're practicing uh, bhakti yoga, doing sadhana and the devotional service, we carry that with us when we leave and when we come back, we pick up where we left off. So again, not all karma is negative. The scriptures can help us to avoid negative karmic reactions by prescribing lifestyles that help us steer clear of trouble. So it's reading the scriptures, hearing from the teachers, and applying what we hear in our everyday life practically. For example, many scriptures recommend a vegetarian lifestyle. By refusing to inflict cruelty on our fellow living entities, we also can avoid the harsh ramification that such institutionalized cruelty brings to our society. Violence, hunger, suffering, and a wide array of health problems, among others. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we're going next week. We're going to deal with sense control, the kingdom of God. This chapter is almost complete, but these were two important sections. I feel that we needed to hear about, to think about, to work on. Um, I was looking. I thought I had some questions for you. How about this? Think on this for a week. Which verse in the Bhagavad Gita explains the transmigration of the soul? How has the fast-paced impersonal culture influenced people around the world? Explain how our thoughts and actions shape what we will become. And that's a good question because you can just look at yourself every day. What am I thinking? What are my actions? What was my thinking yesterday? What was my action, actions today? What did I do when someone said so-and-so or looked at me in a way I didn't like or whatever? Think about that because you're shaping. <laughs> your future, what you will become. And 
karma can snap back pretty fast sometimes. I've, I've seen it um, this in a, in a lifetime. So it's to be very careful. Because Krishna, if he wants you to come real fast, he doesn't wait. He gets you right away. So, and we also define karma. What is karma? Okay, one more. And experiencing various miseries based on our karma, what must we realize? Okay? How many people in the chat are getting these? Yeah, so forth. And there are others out there, I'm sure. Of who, who, anyone have any questions, comments, or? Um, Everyone says thank you for the wonderful class. Mm. Um, okay, don't go away, you four. Ms. Four, you say. Thank you for your thank you. I thank you for being there. And based on what you heard tonight, would any of you want to share any point, aspect, realization, a word, a sentence you heard that may you may carry with you from the program? Would you be willing to do that? I'll wait. Anybody writing? Anything coming? <laughs> and who's out there? Uban Mohan and who else? Karuna Shakti. Karuna? Mm -hmm. Karuna Shakti. And Bhakti Shruti. And Bhakti Shruti. Welcome, Bhakti Shruti. We haven't been in touch for a while. I, I went to Facebook for a hot minute today. I just, I find that so intimidating. It's like so much on there. But if I'm not mistaken, I think you graduated. I, I need to spend more time. But I thank you for being there. Any comment, question on what you heard um, tonight that you'd want to share? Nothing? Okay. Well, I thank you for being there. And I pray you've gotten something you can use or something may have struck a chord. And we've got a lot to work with with our spiritual warrior tools and technologies and understanding. And we will continue with, um, we'll conclude this chapter next week. And if any of you have any spiritual warrior book that, you like or a chapter that you feel maybe would be good to share with others let me know and don't forget I think you have my email now you can write to me um, when we're offline okay so I thank you for being there have a wonderful wonderful blessed week and let your thoughts words and actions be of the highest and we'll look forward to meeting with you next week Hare Krishna good night Karuna Shakti shares, let us enthusiastically end the cycle of birth and death with the wonderful chanting of the holy name. Chai, Karuna Shakti, chanting the holy name. One way to end it, the way to end it. Thank you for that comment. And you caught us just before we went off. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that's very important. Those who are chanting, and if any are not, we can introduce you to it. Thank you, dear, very much. Okay, that's a nice ending.